Mindy Romero, Director of the Center for Inclusive Democracy at the USC Price School of Public Policy. Welcome to Behind Closed Doors, a four-part webinar series exploring the entrenchment of racism in politics, U.S. politics, and its impact on political power and representation in communities. The series is hosted by the California Black Freedom Fund, the Latino Community Foundation, and the API Civic Engagement Fund, as well as, of course, the Center for Inclusive Democracy and our home partners, the USC Price School of Public Policy. So today's webinar is, specifically today's webinar, is the third installment in the series. Its title is Behind Closed Doors, Re Redistricting. Does it really have to be zero-sum politics? How multiracial coalitions have worked together to build political power for all. Before we start the conversation, I'd like to specifically thank the individuals from our partner organizations that were involved in every aspect of the planning of this series, and for which I'm greatly uh, appreciative of, uh, for that partnership, Mark Philpart, uh, Unsuk Lee, and Christian Arana. And I also want to thank James Woodson, uh, who is not only a panelist today, but um, was very much involved um, with the putting together of this uh, panel today and making everything possible. And I also want to ignore, uh, acknowledge, of course, that um, February is Black History Month, and Price uh, has a, um, a whole schedule of events and talks and uh, conversations that it's having, having across the campus and across the school, and we're uh, very grateful to be a part of that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to Amy Dominguez-Arms. I'm just giving the opening, opening remark. She is our uh, seasoned moderator. We're very grateful to have her. She's very well known in the uh, nonprofit organizing world in the conversation around redistricting and of course in the philanthropic world. And she's currently a philanthropic nonprofit consultant. Again, her bio will be in the chat in just a moment. Amy, take it away. Thank you so much, Mindy. And I'm really thrilled and honored to facilitate today's conversations among some of the state's leading top organizers and thought leaders on creating an inclusive multiracial democracy. We're going to dive into their reflections on the conversation about race and representation in Los Angeles and beyond, and also learn from their experiences creating and sustaining multiracial coalitions focused on redistricting and other issues. So I'm really excited for this conversation and just um, so glad you can all join us today. So I'm going to invite the panelists to turn on their cameras um, while I do brief introductions. Uh, of each of them. So we have on our panel today, Pablo Rodriguez, Executive Director of Communities for a New California, which builds power in California and the rural Sierra foothills, San Joaquin, Central and Imperial Valleys to create political will and economic change where communities prosper. We have Hector Sanchez, Deputy Director of Community Coalition, uh, which works to transform the social and economic conditions in South Los Angeles and also serves as a national leader in the field of community organizing. James Woodson is executive director of the California Black Power Building Network, a united ecosystem of black grassroots organizations working to change the lived conditions of black Californians by dismantling systemic and anti-black racism. And Cha Vang, deputy director of AAPIs for Civic Empowerment, which is a statewide network of grassroots organizations building progressive AAPI political power in California to advance racial and economic justice. So we're gonna spend about the first 35 minutes or so hearing from the panelists. I'll be asking them questions, first about their work combating racism and then their approach during redistricting. Um, and then I'll open it up to your questions. So please feel free starting now to add your questions um, via the Q&A feature, um, because we really want to hear from you and respond to the topics that, that you're curious about. So again, thank you all. And I am going to put the first question to you, Hector. As an organization focused on the city of Los Angeles, what was your reaction at the release of the LA City Council recordings? And what are your thoughts about the conversation on Black and Latino representation in the aftermath of the recordings release? Hi, Amy. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, you know, happy to be here. Um, I think, you know, I remember vividly what I was doing when, when I received the call about, you know, whether or not I had heard the recordings and I was hanging out with family at that time. It was a weekend. And so I, you know, 
one of the uh, my initial reactions personally was, you know, complete chaos is about to, you know, embark upon us. Uh, I think as an organization, our response was, you know, having to one process, but quickly get, you know, get into action mode and figure out exactly what is it that we need to do to respond to this, because this is definitely not the sentiment of organizations like Community Coalition and all the other organizations that you're that you see here today. And so trying to do both the processing and then also getting into action was something that was was uh, was a, a huge task at hand. I think, um, you know, my uh, initial thoughts is one, probably the most devastating, the devastating uh, points that was being raised in the recordings was how do we build Latino power and, and at the expense of other communities, disempower communities, especially Black community. Uh, when we think about, you know, the uh, devastation that the redistricting process can have, like this is what exactly it can do. It can create communities that have been disempowered, that get re removed uh, from the political spectrum or uh, decision making. Uh, um, and so to me, that was one of the biggest, uh, 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 I guess, points that was being raised and 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 the thing that 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 uh for personally feel like it it created a responsibility for us as Latinos to think about exactly uh what anti-blackness means in our communities. Um, as Latinos we have a responsibility and so uh to really uplift the voices of our black and brown uh of our black uh brothers and sisters and to me this definitely um lifted that. Thank you so much. And I mean, I'm going to ask the other panelists questions, but also feel free to reflect back on some of the comments of, of your colleagues. Um, there's a lot here, obviously, to unpack. Um, but Pablo, I wanted to turn it to you. You know, some have framed what, have hap what happened on those recordings as an illegitimate way to solve a legitimate problem, the, the lack of Latino representation. And, but others have argued that what we heard were elected officials looking out for their own interests, uh, not those of the community. So how do we think about the need to build community power juxtaposed to the building of power for elected officials who represent communities? Just share some of your thoughts you. on that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question, Amy. Um, I fully 100% reject that it was an attempt to ensure Latino representation. I think that anybody that listens to the audios um, it's very clear that you have a group of people wanting to put their thumb on their scales to tip it in their direction, right? And it's not in regards to a community-wide benevolent effort for Latino representation. I think that it was more self selfish. And it's clear, right, in regards to that of personal um, personal power, right, of being kingmakers behind the scenes, just like the way that we have here the title of the of the of the webinar today behind closed doors when i heard the audios i think the bit the first thing that i that came to my mind was in there was no better argument for having independent redistricting commissions where we take the hand we take the decision making power out of the elected officials and make sure that it is in the, in the hands of independent commissions that don't have a stake in the outcome right and there's ups and downs that we can see and that we've experienced with the state commission the state independent commission but overall, I think that we can make the argument that the statewide commission was more responsive, significantly more responsive within their jurisdictions that they had to that they had to draw, while local and county municipalities and municipalities and jurisdictions were just a nightmare to be able to try to work for work with and around because they had their hidden agendas. And so I think that what we really should be talking about if we're talking about really building power right through these structures what is really happening is that the timeline starts with the census with us organizing ourselves with us partnering with organizations in the way that we did in the san joaquin valley where we started as a base of the fresno county civic engagement table and grew out from there working with organizations that represented different ethnicities and different races and i'll go into that more um later in the webinar but I think that the biggest point that I will make here is that there could be no bigger argument for needing independent redistricting commissions who do not and will not put their thumb on their scale for their own personal profit. 
Great. Thank you so much. And Cha, I want to turn to you, you know, uh, another aspect of, of racism that we've seen are the anti Asian sentiments being on the rise, and we've seen acts of violence committed against the API communities. Curious to hear from you what type of impact that has had on your work and how you think about safety in this context, knowing community safety is critical for the communities with whom you work. Um, but on the other hand, the word public safety has been used often to disproportionately harm BIPOC communities, particularly Black communities. So how do you balance that um, and think about that in the context of your work. Thank you, Amy, for that question. Um, you know, I'll start by saying that we definitely need to redefine what public safety is and in a way where our communities feel like they're empowered, that they're def they're safer, um, not just with law enforcement, but actually in the communities, in the people around them. But also, um, just to kind of um, pull it back to, and how you mentioned a APIs for Civic Empowerment Education Fund is um, a network of incredible Asian American organizations who across the state doing uh, work in communities every day, before, during, and after the pandemic. And, um, and our organizations have have been at the front lines of taking care, engaging in and with in and with their communities for a very long time. And I'll acknowledge that uh, the Asian American community is also very diverse. And we have, uh, and all the work that we do have to be in, in language. Um, and while our the violence against our uh, Asian, uh, Asian American communities have increased, it is not new. And I think this is where we need to kind of uh, just, uh, the, the traditional media has really uh, amplified the violence, which we know that it's not new to our communities, but it's also not lost on us that this violence is linked to the same violence other Black, Indigenous, people of color communities have historically experienced. And the root of it is still the systems of oppression and white, uh, white supremacy cultures that exist. And um, we... We think it's also very important to acknowledge the violence and the fears of our Asian American communities that, and their experiences and their feelings. At the same time, we continue to remind our folks that we always have taken care of ourselves and that more law enforcement and this concept of law enforcement as public safety uh, has never made it, made it any safer for any of our communities. Mm -hmm. And um, as we are really talking about policies um, where we are careful and clear that uh, whatever policies, resources we are fighting for at all levels do not have a negative impact on other Black, indig uh, Black Indigenous and people of color communities. And um, at the same time, we also know that our work and the changes that we want for Asian American communities are shared by our uh, other communities. And um, we also can't achieve anything uh, alone. And our work is actually in partnership uh, with others. Um, and you know, I think for API, uh, API Force, our, we've been very fortunate to be able to build over the years with folks like Hector, Pablo, and uh, James so that we can actually check in, support each other in times like the LA crisis, right? Um, I want to say a big impact on this uh, that we've had is also the, the uh, narrative work that we have to do in our uh, in our communities and with the traditional media and social media. It's like been a, uh, uplifted as an important part of our work, right? That um, we as Asian Americans actually are not used as a wedge in, a, in these times of crisis and also uh, on important issues around um, police brutality, um, law enforcement, and that the violence that are happening in our communities actually are actually a big a part of a bigger um, problem that we need to address. And it's not just siloed in in our communities, but um, it's actually in in relationship with uh, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, communities. Thank you so much, Cha. There's so much to unpack here, and I'm I'm really glad to see there's already questions in the queue. So keep those questions coming. Um, I know I've thought of many myself as as follow up. Um, but James, I want to turn to you. You know, as one of the leaders of the California Black Census and Redistricting Hub, 
In what way did you see the sentiments we're talking about here on that recording that Cha's lifting up? In what way did you see that those sentiments play themselves out in the redistricting process, if, if you did? Yeah, Amy, I, you know, first, <clears throat> let me just say, uh, really just how honored I am to be on a panel with these other folks, including you. Um, you know, I think even though we certainly experienced sort of anti-Black racism during this process, I think uh, having partnerships like the the ones that we have with the organizations on this on this call and the people on this call uh, really helped us uh, to kind of navigate that that situation. You know, I think it was really to hear the LA City Council recordings. Unfortunately, it was really kind of triggering because I think. A lot of the sentiments that we heard on those tapes uh, were things that we either sort of indirectly experienced or, or sometimes directly uh, experienced. And, you know, I think it's important to say that while folks focus on maybe some of the like more sort of blatant name calling that was on the tapes, there was actually a lot of different dynamics happening in those tapes. Uh, and, you know, I kind of think about it on three different levels, right? There was sort of interpersonal racism going on where, you know, Black children are being described as accessories or, you know, there was talk about actually beating a Black child, um, right? There's talks about, you know, Indigenous folks being ugly and, uh, you know, just certain people being with the quote unquote blacks, right? So you had this kind of interpersonal kind of vicious name calling and and just sentiments that were happening. Um, and then you had sort of, right, sort of micro, what I call micro systemic pieces in it where we actually had a whole process that was given over to an advisory committee uh, blown up for, you know, by people who were on those tapes. And, uh, and using their positions of power to derail a process that really was looking to bring in the public, right? And then I think you have the kind of micro systemic pieces uh, where, you know, again, you, you kind of had, uh, you know, to Pablo's point, right? We see across the, the, the state that there are processes that are controlled, right? Not by the people, but by uh, elected officials and, and people who are just trying to hold on to power. Um, and I think that really sort of reflected our experience uh, as leaders for the Black community in the redistricting process. So for instance, the interpersonal, and maybe I, I'll describe it more so as inner organizational piece is, you know, we had folks, unfortunately, who we were actually in kind of coalition and partnership with uh, who were having behind closed doors conversations, right? Uh, essentially talking about how Black folks and us in particular were going to use the summer of 2020 and everything that happened there to try to gain sympathy and to, you know, use that somehow to our advantage, right? Um, and so, you know, again, I think the relationships we have um, helped us to realize sort of what we were facing and and all that stuff, but you know, we had to deal with what it looks like to be in collaboration and co coalition with somebody who would say those things behind closed doors, right? I think, you know, as much as we had to deal with kind of a state process, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the capacity to do local redistricting as well. But as Pablo mentioned, you had processes all across the state where elected officials may not have been caught on tape, but we're saying very similar things or acting in similar ways is what we saw happening in LA. So this is not just an LA problem, right? This is a full state country issue. Um, and then, you know, again, on the macro level, right, we sort of have both the gutting of the Voting Rights Act that sort of, you know, serve to protect the communities that all of us uh, serve and care about. Um, you had, you know, inequities in census counts, right? Where we know that there are certain communities that are traditionally undercounted. And so that shows up, right, in redistricting. Um, 
And then, right, coupled with the the gutting of the VRA, we also had sort of a devaluing and undermining. One of the things that we lifted up during the state process was that um, there were packing sort of fourth uh, am- 14th Amendment uh, constitutional issues, right? Knowing that a constitutional issue really sort of trumps the, even the VRA that was largely sort of ignored when we would bring it up, right? And so um, I think, right, the we know that racism acts, you know, acts on all three of those levels, the interpersonal, the kind of micro systemic and the macro systemic. And I think we heard the same thing on those tapes. And I think we certainly experienced that sort of being involved in the process, um, at least on the state level, um, in all three of those levels. So, um, but again, I think the partnerships that we had, the relationships we built really helped us to kind of navigate those and, um, and, and, you know, ultimately got us, I think, the results that we were looking for. But it, it certainly was a challenge. Yeah. Thank you so much, really, James, for your thoughtful remarks and, and lifting up these various facets, you know, that need to be thought about, addressed. Um, Again, such a rich first part of our conversation. I'm glad to see there's questions in the queue. We're going to now dive into redistricting, which uh, one of you noted, you know, is where a lot of these tensions really can play themselves out. And yet, and it's such a critical process for representation for the decade ahead. So we're going to hear from all of you as to how you approach this, and in particular, um, many of you looking to multiracial coalitions um, to execute on this work. So. Hector, let me start with you. Um, you know, Community Coalition has a long history of building bridges across race in South Los Angeles. And out of that work, you formed the People's Block, a multiracial table intended to build an intersectional approach to the redistricting process. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to convene the People's, Bro- People's Block? You know, what approach you used to hold together a big, diverse, multiracial coalition and Again, were there specific strategies or tactics you used to hold that coalition together during the process? Sure. So, you know, I think that uh, the redistricting process as a whole is a process that tries to prevent people from actually engaging, right? It tries to make it such an obscure process that people don't feel like they, they can participate in any way, shape, or form, or that they don't have the skill set, right, to be able to participate in redistricting, but yet it has such, you know, huge impact in our, in our, in our, uh, in the way that our communities are being governed. And so I think, you know, because of the decades of work that we've been doing uh, around multiracial coalition, it it only made sense that we needed to bring, you know, uh, folks together uh, throughout the county, throughout the city, the, uh, the state, to really think about how do we engage our communities around this process that seems to be so obscure, and at the same time deal with some of the tensions that automatically, as folks have raised, are created through this redistricting process. And so, you know, we uh, were able to to build a, a pretty successful uh, block that um, that at the core had equity and solidarity as its as one of its core values, and committing itself to um, you know, communities that have historically been oppressed and ignored with this process, uh, um, putting them in the forefront. Um, this this coalition, this multiracial coalition, really unified around, you know, the overall goal of using uh, this opportunity to, to figure out how do we dismantle or chip away at white supremacy, which I feel at the core is, um, you know, um, what we've had to deal with. And let me just preface by saying this, that this process of redistricting um, is a process that is already against us. It's putting us against, putting communities already against each other. Um, And, you know, especially in in the city of LA, in the county of LA, being so big and having such limited representation already has put the cards uh, against us. And so having, you know, having to go through a process of, of saying the draw the line agreeing in how the lines get drawn is such a it's such a um you know um a delicate kind of way of of how do we talk to each other about you know why it makes sense that we move this direction or another and i and i can say that 
it's not that the people's bloc were always in agreement with each other. There was definitely tensions that we had to, you know, deal with, but because we've been able to build the political trust with each other, it was a process that allowed us to, to really engage in some of those conversations. Um, and um, uh, again, the core at the core was being putting the voices of our people at the forefront of all this. You know, one point that, that I did wanted to lift around this was that uh, in, in the city of LA, having an independent redistricting commission makes even more sense after seeing the process of a uh, of of the um, play itself out. One, you had a commission that was that, that had elected officials appoint right their representatives, and then when those representatives weren't doing the will of those elected officials, they get removed, and then someone else was being placed into that position, and so on and so forth. And then um, you know. It 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 obviously was a a just for show. It was a lot of work just for show because at the end of the day, when it was presented to city council, it was just you know scratch and said we're going to do it ourselves. And so to me, uh, to Pablo's point, it definitely lifted the 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 notion that we need to have a real, true, independent redistricting commission. Um, but again, you know just. The purpose of the People's Block was really to ensure that the redistricting process was guided by principles of solidarity and racial equity uh, that included substantive grassroots leadership um, to try to increase power and representation for our BIPOC communities. Um, and so we were able to come up with solidarity maps. We were able to, that was an outcome uh, we, uh, that increased political power for, for our communities. We involved hundreds of thousands of people in the process, community residents in the process, held focus groups, held com you know, community meetings where these masks were presented to try to engage them. Uh, and we were able to build a, a, a powerful alliance of really power building constituency based organizations that that helped inform these maps. So these, you know, we're very proud of the work that we did. Um, I think that to me, it, it, it created a lot of um, um, opportunities of what's to come and what can be. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we're just gonna ask, a, I'm just gonna ask a few more questions of the panel and then we're gonna turn to the audience questions. So again, uh, keep adding those into the queue. Um, let me turn to you now, Pablo. You know, you all convened a, a similar table in the Central Valley where multiple communities of color came together to do redistricting and, and advocate for joint maps. Can you tell us a little bit more about that coalition and what approaches you used to help mitigate, navigate conflicts and, and how the experience went? Sure, I think that what's important to state here is that the coalition that we formed was born out of the Fresno County Civic Engagement Table. So it began with um, organizations such as um, the Fresno Metro Black Chamber, Faith in the Valley, Hmong Innovating Politics, um, Jakar Movement and Communities from California, all organizations that have the technology and the experience to do mass civic engagement programs. And then from there, we built out, um, knowing and understanding that we would be doing work outside of the county of Fresno. So we partnered with California Common Cause to provide technical assistance, we had a relationship also with MOLDEP and relationship also with the University of California um, Community Labor Center also to provide support on, on the technical side of, of issues that we needed, um, specifically with Maptitude, right? And so we had all of these, these pieces come together since the census I wanna bring up, right? So the, the table was formed in 2015, but we began working and, and organizing ourselves, getting ready for redistricting through the census. And that was in June of 2019 with an understanding that demographics are not destiny, right? And I think that that's really important for us to say because towards the end of redistricting or in the middle of redistricting, right? It became very, very clear that there were some organizations that were not necessarily part of our coalition who wanted to run up the score and have as many as, as large of a Latino majority district as possible. But what we did not subscribe to was that demographics were destiny, that Latinos were all going to vote in one specific way or the other, right? So what we did was, <clears throat> as we finished our work with the census, which was our coalition was called 
went, the, went that Conmigo coalition that covered the counties from San Joaquin County all the way down to Kings County in the San Joaquin Valley. We all in combined had an effort of reaching over 250,000 residents during the census because of the understanding that we had with going door to door, speaking to, to residents about the census. We also were able to have a very fundamental understanding of the neighborhoods that we were working in. And I think what's important to state is that as we started looking at jurisdictions, it became very clear that you could pick any jurisdiction and you would find 70% to 80% of any given jurisdiction was now going to be majority um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color when you added up all, all, the, all of our folks, right? And so gaining one or two percentage points, three percentage points more Latino voters was really irrelevant. So what we did was following the Fair Maps Act is that we drew our maps, we drew our communities of interest, and then depending on the jurisdiction, we would overlay the ideal maps that we would that we would propose. Um, and for the most part, we were in agreement with those things. It was when we were trying to work with other organizations that were not a part of our coalition and trying to get at unity maps that that became a challenge. And it was mo usually mostly right with organizations that were more Latino centric, unwilling to budge, unwilling to compromise in submitting a unity map, which was unfortunate. But uh, at the end of the day, we were happy with the results and what we were able to accomplish together on the in the process of redistricting the residents, I think, in a really ironic way, right, because they were able to experience both. I'll give the example of the Fresno County Board of Supervisors and the city of Fresno um, City Council, who are on ideological opposite spectrums, the supervisor, super conservative, the um, city council of Fresno being more left-leaning, did exactly the same thing. They did exactly the same thing and ultimately chose their own maps. The They had advisory committees, which was a farce. And our residents that we worked with, our volunteers that we worked with, were able to see the process and how it was flawed and how it is that we need to be better and how it is that we need to be best prepared. So I think that what we are looking at now is preparation going into 2028 that leads right and understanding census triggers redistricting that needs to be a program that's together and not separate the way that we did it this last cycle and that redistricting depending on the jurisdiction will be a really long labor intensive process that we need to be better prepared for with not just volunteers but paid staff to sit in and, and track jurisdictions and decisions that they're making during these long meetings right um and I think that, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll close there and forget, I don't mean to be long winded, but I think that the biggest thing that I could, could say about the coalition and the way that we were able to navigate differences is just to state demographics are not destiny. We knew as community based organizations that do voter engagement, that there was a lot of work to do to engage voters after the fact. And just because of their ethnicity did not mean that they were going to vote in any particular way, you still need to engage them especially in jurisdictions throughout California, but I will highlight the San Joaquin Valley, where you can pick your jurisdiction and 30% of any given jurisdiction or no, no party preference. And through polling and research that we have done internally ourselves um, through data for social good and our Fresno County Civic Engagement Table know that they, those 30% of the no party preference voters do not believe the Democrats, nor do they believe the Republicans are the good guys. So there's a lot of work to be done in order to engage and build trust in the whole process. Um, I hope I answered Great. your question, but there's many layers to to what it is that we were that we were really navigating. But the the bottom line is that we wanted to make sure that everybody was included um, through our coalition and make sure that the white supremacy was not profitable in this case, right? For power, yeah. knowing that it's right. theft, exclusion, and exploitation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. That profits that causes white supremacy to profit. So that's what we wanted to interrupt. So I'll stop there. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just want to lift up, you know, an element that I heard both in, in Hector and Pablo's explanation is this that the work starts years before redistricting. I think that sometimes, you know, funders who are going to support. So this is a message to funders in the audience, you know, who are going to support community groups, do the civic engagement, do the 
the public engagement and redistricting think about it in the you know the o one year after the census. But what I'm hearing, you know, you're talking about getting ready for the next round in twenty eight. I mean, it's the trust building that needs to happen and the relationships for to navigate the tough conversations and sometimes conflicts that come up in redistricting that needs to happen you know, years earlier. So I really hear kind of this long tail of work to have these successful multiracial coalitions uh, to be effective as redistricting comes into play. So that's that's my uh, note for funders on the call as we think about supporting this work. Um, Cha, let me turn to you. You know, can you describe your process for working within and beyond AAPI communities during the redistricting process? You know, how did you prepare communities for the inevitable negotiations that were going to happen during redistricting, sometimes the tensions? And how do you ensure that your partnerships with other communities stay intact during and, and after the redistricting process? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it was also uh, it was important for us as a uh, API specific environment. Um, to be a part of a larger a multiracial coalition. Um, you know, so we were a member of the IBE Redistricting Alliance, also a very active in the um, unity mapping through which Pablo had mentioned, and really also making sure that we ground the redistricting work in, as Hector had mentioned, equity, racial justice, and solidarity. And, um, and we, I think we knew going in that Asian, in some parts of the state, Asian Americans actually and Pacific Islanders are large majorities, but in many of the parts of the state, we were also a small group and that we wasn't going to get everything we wanted, but like, what are the places that, what, where are the things that we can, um, we can work out with other communities of uh, color, right? Um, and so like, and I wanted to also say, as Hector had mentioned earlier, um, redistricting is really complex for and boring, <laughs> but uh, important to make sure that fair lines were drawn and, uh, you know, which would not further disenfranchise uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities even more, right? Um, and this is also a chance to make sure that we were, we had a chance at electing representation that had community interests in mind. Um, to Pablo's point, like, because the, the process of census and redistricting was so separate, and I, um, many of our organizations came out of a long, tiring census campaign, and they were, and we were still in a pandemic. Uh, so redistricting was like the last thing they really wanted to engage in. Um, so that actually put a lot more, um, uh, a lot more pressure on us to like really spend the good chunk of the year to educate the organization's leadership, their staff, their base, and the community about what redistricting means and that redistricting is actually a continuation of what census was. And it all really matters to making sure that our communities are seen uh, and heard, right? That um, we connect the state redistricting to the local because many of our organizations are local that are and each at all the levels that our organizations in their base felt empowered to vocalize their needs and and then at the same time be able to make sure that we um are working with other uh communities of color to uh, just make sure that we are aligning our maps and that we're working to about build power for all of us right um we, it's never been a this, it has to be this way or the other way. It's always been, and we can do better, right? Um, and I think earlier Hector had um, just kind of mentioned the process of redistricting is just a dis, uh, just further disenfranchise our communities because if you look at what time the hearings were at, like a lot of our communities are at work, they're working with the job, they can't, they can't spend four or five hours on these hearings to really fight, uh, to be really vocal about their needs. And then also the timeline of when the redistricting process was um, was uh, happening was actually pretty bad because it was also during holidays. So 
just making sure that our folks understood like how much time and how much um, work was going to go into it was like a big part of how we needed to educate our folks. Um, I want to say, you know, I think in regions, as I mentioned, in regions where Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were a large majority of the population, uh, we were able to be, they're more visible in the mapping um, conversations. So I think we were able to keep whole as much as possible, but and felt more doable, right? Um, where parts of the state that had a smaller amount of Asian American and Pacific Islanders, it was important for us to be very vocal about the negative impacts it had uh, uh, if we were not to be, if we were not able to keep them whole in different in districts, right? Uh, and that representation, um, and they are critical to also winning power for for our folks. That it's not just about one group having uh, being in that district, but it's actually a collective power building strategy, right? Um, and then also, uh, also to just make sure that, as I mentioned, making sure that uh, we knew. <laughs> Uh, as we said, we knew that we wasn't going to get everything, but what was some of the things that we can we can uh, let go, and some of the things that we were like, no, this is not, but this is not how uh, it should be, and we are going to continue fighting for it, and uh, prepping people to be able to testify and making um, and having these conversations in our coalitions was like really critical, right? And having allies uh, with other organizations have been like such a great. Um, uh, thing for us to be able to be like, let's have an honest conversation about what it means to cut out Asian Americans from this district or or cut them into different parts of, uh, into different pieces, right? Um, and I'll just also address the tension conversation. I think we had a moment in one of our mapping, um, uh, during the mapping session where, uh, or during the hearings where we had some, uh, our South Asian communities calling in and pushing some of the boundaries up north and really crossing where we had agreed with our indigenous folks around, actually, this is like too far up. And so API Force uh, being a part of the coalition and the alliance and then having a partners on the ground uh, who had connections, who have these base calling. It's like, let's, where can, how far can we push up? And how much uh, can we actually move folks to like compromise somewhere? That was like really critical to uh, to making sure that our relationships and then our relationship with the organizations are intact, and also that we are working with other communities of color to really um, draw a map that is fair for all uh, all of them. Great, thank you so much. And then, uh, so my last question, then we're going to open up. We have a lot in the queue, so we'll try to get to those really quickly. Um, but James, maybe you could just uh, wrap us up on this and share how how did you prepare your team and the coalition for the redistricting process, knowing that there were, you know, some of these issues, in particular, you know, anti-black sentiments among that might exist within other communities of color, which you may have been seeking to partner engage. How do you prepare folks to engage in this process? Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, so maybe first thing I want to say is, you know, I can only speak to our um, experience in the state process. Uh, I did want to note that uh, Common Cause and ACLU and ALC and a bunch of other folks uh, have a report that kind of lays out what happened in local redistricting. Um, that I think is really good and can kind of give folks a sense of like just how much, um, you know, sort of incumbency protection, status quo, racism was happening on a local level. Uh, so I did want to mention that, you know, I think to answer your question, Amy, that we uh, had to do, quite frankly, what a whole bunch of Black folks have to do in their everyday life. And that is to work twice as hard, to be twice as good, to get equal results, right? And so we talk a lot about the talk that Black families have to have with their kids about the police. This is, I think, the other talk that Black parents have with their kids of, you know, I know my mom had it with me, right? That, uh, again, we have to do twice as much, work twice as hard. And so um, I think it underscores your point, though, about starting early. So we 
uh, were able to start talking to our re, uh, to our, our coalition about redistricting um, back in 2019, uh, as Pablo mentioned. Um, to Cha's point, right, that subject can be not just boring, but can seem irrelevant uh, when you're so far out. Like people are just like, well, how does this relate to my everyday work? How does this relate to my life? Um, and I think what we found is that um, talking to folks helped prime the pump for when that conversation uh, did come up, that folks weren't sort of surprised or taken off, off uh, guard uh, when it got to 20, you know, 2021 and we were actually in the thick of things, talking about communities of interest and lines and all that, that stuff. So I would just underscore your point about starting early and the need to like form, not only do training with our, our own communities, but to form these, these relationships and these, these partnerships, I think are, are really important. You know, I talked about the sort of systemic racism that exists within redistricting, right? But it also exists without, outside of redistricting and has an effect on the redistricting process. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've seen that Black communities have essentially been gentrified and displaced over the last sort of several decades, right? And what that did in redistricting is created a situation where, you know, not only did I push our team, but I think really we had to draw more maps, draw wider maps, right? To almost do it on all levels because our folks were just all over the place, uh, right? They weren't in these sort of traditional urban hubs like LA and Oakland, but they started to move into places in Contra Costa and San Joaquin and throughout the Central Valley and in the Inland Empire and down in San Diego, right? And so that just means that we have to draw more and draw again on all, all levels. And I, I think that takes resources, time, expertise, right? We were able to bring on um, USC's um, uh, ERI uh, department to, to help us with drawing some of those lines, right? And so having that type of expertise to really help us, I think, uh, you know, help us, helped us have a, a, a really big impact. Maybe the last thing I'll say is that we came into the process very clear about what our hard lines and what our flex points were going to be. And I think, you know, in some ways that made some partners upset because they felt like, well, you guys aren't, you know, willing to give, you're not compromising. But I think what we did strategically is kind of came in with a compromise, right? We, so I, one thing I think is important to say is that I don't think that most people in the Black community are scared of Latino or AAPI power, right? That there is a sentiment that, you know, I think Cha spoke to this, that we're all moving together and that we can, we have shared interests and values that can benefit all of us. What I do think people are against, and I know what I'm against, is Latino and AAPI power that then tramples over Black political power, right? And so I think that that tension and that that sort of uh, through line is a hard thing to balance, right? It's easy to just kind of go into your own uh, kind of cocoon and worry about your own. It's harder to build relationships to to be about everybody. Um, but you know, I think you know Hector and Pablo and Child spoke to this. I think we get better results when we do that, right? And so. Um, I think it's just important that we continue to 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 push on that that point and um and and just realize right that we chat chat talked about it we need to prepare our folks our communities to have these tough conversations but be willing to compromise and give and uh and meet people kind of where they are great great point thank you so much so let's turn to some of these good questions folks have teed up so someone asked about um the the issue of can we achieve fair representation through redistricting if we have continue to have a single member district um you know construct for our representation so this person is posing the idea of what do you all think about using ranked choice voting to have proportional representation multi-member districts is this anything that any of your organizations are working on thinking about um 
if anyone wants to speak to that. I mean, I can just kind of chime in and say um, that I think there's a lot that we can do. I think ranked choice voting is a, is a piece of it. Um, I think there's, I think the issue really is that um, we, that, that the country and, and the state hasn't fully lived into the democratic values that we think we, we have, right? And so I think what we have is a lot of, and I don't mean this in the sort of capital R sense, but a lot of republicanism of like, right? Even I think that seeps into our communities where we think we're just going to elect this person and they're going to handle, right? They're going to make all of these decisions on our behalf and they're going to handle things for us. But we haven't really figured out ways to like bring power back to people. I think, you know, Pablo talked about that. And so I think that we would certainly be interested in anything that kind of moves us in that direction. I think we think that, you know, ranked choice voting is part of that solution. I think part of it is the independent redistricting commission. And I think there's also just other things that we need to do in terms of how government works and how people think about their relationship to government that also needs to happen um, to, to move us closer to, to true democracy. Great, thanks James. I'll lift up another question that uh, talks about a, another facet of both fair and effective representation. And that's around um, providing both candidate and public um, officials training for folks once they get into office. Here's someone from Contra Costa County noting that you know a number of folks have been um, elected to offices, but do they have the training, particularly you know, folks who may be new to this, uh, she uh, references lat new Latinos on the school board. To what extent are any of your organizations either involved in that, in training folks to, to run for office, doing that kind of training, or once folks get in office, helping them to navigate, you know, these roles um, and support them in, in these roles? I mean, I think that that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, that candidate development is very key. Uh, we can't, um, you know, just to 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 uh, to James' earlier point is we can't just let the process be. We have to make the process work for us, and that process includes candidate development and making sure that that you know our folks are ready to to play a key role, a leadership role within within government. Uh, and I think that. You know, um, I know there's a lot of of work that that is is being in the thought in the thinking process, planning process around candidate development now. But it is a very important uh, um, element to to power building. I think. Thank you, Mike. Good comment. As Hector had mentioned, I think there's. Uh, there's organizations, I think, across the state that are doing candidate um, and elected uh, elective training to recruit and um, to train them after they're they after after they are elected. I think the biggest piece is like it's uh, we we always hope that there's more people who are interested and in, to. Uh, to get those trainings, but we also know that once um, they get elected, it's like, how do we continue to keep them accountable? Because the trainings, I think, uh, is only so good to, like, recruit folks, but I feel like it's less, um, it's less desirable for our electives once they get into office. So how do you actually build these relationships with them and um, and continue to um, work with them to make sure that you're holding them accountable, but also supporting them, right? because we know that once you get into office, you know, as much as you are progressive going in, like, it does get a little lonely, and, uh, and then there's also a lot of systems and bureaucracy that is working um, against you and sometimes with you, and so for us as community organizations and um, Redistricting is like one step to building power, but once we, we can train and uh, we can train 
uh, candidates and then once they get elected, there's also a whole new process about how do you hold governance uh, and moving forward, right? Uh, Co-governance, even if they don't need, even if they're not trained, trained to be co-governance as community-based organizations and doing uh, this work on a regular basis, we have to actually um, we continue to build this uh, relationship where we can uh, move policies and move things with our electeds, right? Great. Thank you so much. Well, I know we're coming to, to wrap time almost to wrap up. Um, and so I want to just give each panelist a, a minute or two for a, a closing remark. And the question is, you know, based on what we've learned in this cycle and your, you know, together decades of experience in, in organizing and in civic engagement and in democracy, how do we enhance prospects for multiracial solidarity and redistricting in the next cycle. And feel free to offer suggestions for community-based groups, for funders, for the commission, the state commission, for local commissions. You know, there's a lot that we can all do, um, but I will invite you to share your ideas for any one of these actors or multiple of them in terms of what we need to do to, to enhance uh, prospects for multiracial solidarity. So whoever is so moved, um, please feel free to start. I can start. Great, Sean. Um, I feel like we keep emphasizing this um, throughout the, the webinar, but I feel like we have to start early um, and then start as, you know, 20, 20 no, 2030, 31, it's like gonna fast approach. And so this work needs to be, to be, uh, started early, also a continued uh, funding for organizations so that they can have the dedicated staff to really move this work. It's not easy and it's not like, um, and it's also pretty time consuming. Um, and so it, it's like a process of like, we start with census and then we go into redistricting and like prepping folks into it, right? Um, I also think that it, as we had built the coalitions, we were able to be really grounded in what we want to, uh, grounded not in just like uh, rich, uh, just representation of groups, but actually grounded as we had mentioned, like in equity, racial justice, and then the understanding of what solidarity means, right? Because I also think that it's still a learning process of what solidarity means when it becomes like, well, it's either your, uh, when it's like, our communities are being pit together in these in these situations, right? And so, I would say those are the biggest pieces for me. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of education because, to be honest, I did not understand redistricting until almost until in the middle of census. And it's like, okay, I don't want to be a part of redistricting, right? Um, and so, like, how do you actually? Uh, also train people to be on the commissions who are equity and racial justice mind, uh, focused, right? And, um, and are grounded in those values so that we, even if we can't, we can't, uh, we're not, um, they're independent from our stuff. They are also open to listening to the values of the community's voices, right? Great, thank you so much. Others? I can hop in real quick. Um... You know, I think my hope is actually a bit of a a challenge for us all individually. Um, you know, one of the things that we heard on the uh, LA City Council recording, or really in the aftermath, is that uh, one city council member who's still on the city council and should not be, but um, uh, but he 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 made this claim of like that he wasn't the one that said the comments. And that, you know, I guess this this sort of this thing of like, I should have spoken up more. And I just really, I guess, want to challenge uh, all of us to when we hear problematic rhetoric, narrative within our own communities, right? And that, that can often be the times where it's like the toughest because, you know, you want to belong, you want to um, sort of move in solidarity with folks that have these similarities to you. Uh, but I think those are the moments where we can really challenge this the most, right? When you've got family members or you've got partners or 
again, folks within your own community who are uh, lifting up things that you know just aren't right. I think it's imperative on all of us to to speak to that. Um, I think you know, as the Black Power Network, we are in the midst of a of a battle like that. And I think you know, the question is, are we you know willing to uh, quote unquote lose some of you know lose something? to do what's right. And um, I think that's just gonna be really important, right? Like shifting our whole society to a more inclusive and equitable sort of approach is gonna be difficult and it's gonna require difficult conversations, but we gotta be willing to have those, so. Great, thank you, James. Thank you, James, for lifting that. And I think that that's absolutely right. I think, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned in the beginning that that we as Latinos play a critical role in this in in this current moment, given the context of the of the recordings, and I I do I do say that say that not lightly, and I think that that is that you know calling out anti blackness um, uh, sentiments not only within our workplace within our within you know colleagues what have not but also at home is is very critical, um, and so I just wanted to. To ground that, and I think to you know to to Chas' point, the process of building multiracial, building trust, which is very important uh, in in this in this overall process, it starts now, and so it's it's it, it's continuing, you know, on the on the work that we've we've been doing for for many decades, uh, and so not not feeling like we have a pause. But rather just building on that. And if we start doing thinking about census and thinking about redistricting to Pablo's earlier point, you know, in 29 in 2028, 2020, we're late already. Right. And I think that that even just thinking about 2028 is a little bit daunting, but it's, you know, it's right around the corner. And so I think that, you know, uh it's it's important to start the process now to continue to build on what what we've been, you know, working on uh now um and so yeah um that's 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 key and that's hopefully uh part of the vision that i have is that it's 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 uh it's starting that process now great thank you so much and pablo this is a very difficult question for me to answer the reality right that we live in the state of california that has a population of 40 million people so if we take that 40 million right and we just look at the state senate districts there's 40 state senate districts with 1 million people each right each one of those those districts has its own personality has its own makeup of people where the majority right and i understand i'm not sure well anyway i'm going to go into this it's not a republican versus democrat anymore it's corporate democrat versus progressive democrat maybe right and the people who who go into those coalitions and how they partner depending on their goals changes in, in each one of those jurisdictions so i can't give you a blanket answer for how it is that we achieve multi-racial multi-racial coalitions what i can tell you is that the report that has been produced by california common cause and the aclu in their executive summary does a really good job of highlighting two points which i feel is very important for the volunteers of cnc and the people who partner with cnc as an organization and that is transparency and public participation the transparency to be very clear about what process we are following right and what criteria is being followed so we can communicate that to the people who we are working with that is the best way to be very clear about what it is that's happening, right? And that there's some um, level playing field that everybody has to follow. But when we have people who are elected officials, in this case in Los Angeles, who are Latino, who have their thumb on the scales at the expense of others, there's no better way to, to give a rise to cynicism and to break down anything that any organization is trying to do to build a coalition that is multi-ethnic and multi-racial. So I think that I would really encourage everybody to go back to read the Common Cause Report with ACLU. And for me, again, transparency is the biggest thing that can happen because we experienced it again with the Fresno County Board of Supervisors and the City of Fresno City Council who wasted the city council members who were all Democrats 
who wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars paying a demographer to create maps, to create public meetings that were all a farce because in the last week, the city council member subcommittee created their own map, which was what they adopted. And it's just a joke. And so how do you sustain a, a coalition when you have people like that that are the ones that have their thumb on the scales and are the ones that are not being transparent? So I think that transparency and adopting the recommendations that the Common Cause and ACLU report pr promotes is a step in the right direction. And that's the best way I could currently answer that question. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you so much for your time, your wisdom. I always learn in conversation with all of you, and I learned a lot today. I'm sure all of the folks on the call did as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you even more for the work you do day in and day out. Um, and it's just been a wonderful to, to spend this hour plus with you. And I will turn it back over to Mindy to wrap us up. Thanks, Amy. And yes, as a reminder, we are formally going to 115 today, but obviously we're going to end a little early. I want to thank uh, Amy very much for uh, taking the time today to moderate this panel and so skillfully as you have. Um, greatly appreciated. Such an important conversation. And of course, thank our panelists, Pablo and Cha and Hector and, and James and all of you for joining us. I want to um, make sure you're aware that in about a week or so, we're going to have the video and, and all as well as a highlight video of this webinar that'll be available on our website. We'll send it out to our networks and encourage you also to view the uh, previous videos and, of course, be a part of our future webinar in March. Uh, Cha mentioned uh, in her closing remarks or uh, a little while ago um, about this being a learning process, right? And and putting in the time and the long game really, you didn't use that term, but um, but certainly a learning process. And we hope that these videos have a life of their own. So it's a conversation we have today together with all of you. And the videos also can be used to uh, share additional knowledge, to create further conversations, can have a life right beyond these exact webinars that we're all a part of. Um, and I just wanna note, James, you also talked about uh, the uh, importance of honest, right, uh, hard conversations. And that really is the goal of this whole series behind closed doors. Uh, every topic that we've covered, they're all intertwined. And we hope that um, as you leave today, you continue the conversation, you have hard conversations, good conversations, and join us with our next webinar uh, that'll kind of close out the series. But again, um, we encourage things beyond that. So thank you, everyone. And I want to lastly, but not least, um, thank my um, team, the USC Price Communications uh, team that um, also made this possible in terms of setting up the webinar and organizing everything. So thank you, everyone, very much. <laughs>